Soccer X Connected, Ben Jacobs with you. A very good afternoon or good morning if you're in North, South or Central America. It's getting late in Asia as well, but we do have a global audience here today. It's sponsored by Musco Lighting and our theme is stadium and event operations to engage. Those exhibitors are waiting to talk to you via the app. And if you want to see the full schedule, that's available on our website. Follow us on social media as well at Soccer X on Twitter and also Instagram as well for the younger cooler kids will post some photos of the panelists and all of the panels and sessions are available on YouTube as well in due course. Now for added incentive, because we want to engage with you, we've got a very special competition. You can win one of a number of signed shirts simply by telling us who is your shining star in football. And we've asked this question because Tightly with our sponsor for the day, Musco Lighting. And the only catch is they must be 21 years of age or under. Loads of you have been in touch. I think everyone listening must be a Liverpool fan because the most popular answer so far is Harvey Elliott, who is at Liverpool but on loan at Blackburn Rovers in the Championship. Stephen Drennan says Harvey Elliott, insane what he's doing in the Championship this season. But a few of you thinking outside the box and giving us some lesser known names as well. Thanks to Luca for getting in touch via Twitter. He says Alessandro Bastoni from Inter, who is now a regular and having a very good season over in Serie A. JG says Elliot once again and even tags him so he'll be fully aware of the praise and probably slightly confused why a load of random people are suddenly calling him a shining star from all over the world but please do engage with us who is your shining star in football male or female do get involved at soccer x and use that hashtag please soccer x connected and let's have some female players as well lauren james hannah hampton are two that immediately come to mind both going to be in the lionesses setup one assumes for many years to come so day two, Soccer X Connected. We're into the afternoon now. Just want to flag a little side session as well called Team Talks, where a number of different companies will be pitching for five minutes in a almost speed panel. And we've got six or seven speakers. I'll be moderating them. That's underway at four o'clock. And you'll have the opportunity to listen to various pitches and ask some questions as well. So that's going to be really exciting. We've got more details on the app for that particular session. And later in the day, Soccer Edge Soccer X Heritage is also back every night this week at 6 GMT. We'll be looking at a different aspect of the 1930 World Cup. So please do stay tuned for that. But now we move on to our next panel. It's called More Than Match Day. And we are going to be talking about how Stadia can be utilized outside of game days. Because if they are to make money, then at best 50 match days a year will not necessarily be enough if clubs and those around them are to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So given the restrictions in place in many countries, we look now at what options exist for stadium managers and operators to help commercialise non-match days, concerts, conferences and so on. We have a very diverse panel and it includes the following. Scott Jenkins, who is the board chair at Green Sport Alliance, Aldolfo Romero, the Senior Director of Event Programming at the Hollywood Park SoFi Stadium. Alongside those two, we welcome Javier Latore, the Head of Content and Production at Valencia, and also Magda Pozo, who is part of the ownership group for marketing and strategic coordination at Udinese. And I believe as well that Udinese may well be airing parts or all of this session on their official website in due course. So stay tuned to their channels for more details as well. And to keep them all in check and ask those key questions, our moderator is Mark Kelly. He's the managing director of Bristol Sports. Mark, looking forward to this. It's over to you. Hi, good afternoon, Ben, and thank you, and uh, a great welcome to everybody this afternoon. Um, really pleased to be joined by uh, a really strong panel today, and um, with the headline more than just the match day. And I suppose pre-COVID, over the last five or six years, stadia across the world, um, you only have to look at Tottenham Hotspurs more locally to me here in Bristol, have really developed concepts which are more than just the 40, 50 odd sport games uh, a year and, and becoming 365 day a year venues. Um, our own personal experience here at Bristol Sport at Ashton Gate, we spent 50 million pounds uh, four years ago in developing the concept, which was gonna be at the heart of the community of Bristol. So we have two teams, we've got Bristol City football team, we've got Bristol Bears rugby, 
Um, they do 40 to 50 games a year. Um, and we worked incredibly hard pre-COVID in developing a concept where we could open up the stadium to the community for concerts, events, um, and just being very much at the heart of Bristol, both in terms of sport, but also the economic um, domino effect of bringing in big businesses into the stadium and making a big statement to, to our city that we're here to support. Um, obviously, COVID has now hit, um, but I really want to try and concentrate today on what the future looks like. I think us as leaders in the industries should be really involved in what the future looks like for events. Um, we, can, we can look, I know I look with jealousy over Australia and New Zealand who are starting to reopen. And it looks like that they're, they're opening in some level of normality that, to the figures of pre-COVID. So I'm really pleased today that we have such a varied um, panel to discuss about their own thoughts, their own experiences, um, and their own strategies to what the, the future looks like. So really, without further ado, if I can um, hand over to you, uh, Adolfo, your Senior Director Event Programme uh, at the SoFi in Hollywood Park. Um, I'd be keen to start off with you and to get an understanding of what you guys are doing there and, and just maybe a snapshot of your experience for the last nine to 10 months as well. Thank you, Mark, and good morning to everyone from Los Angeles. Um, as you said, it's been, it's been a, a tough, uh, I would say 12 months on, on our side in terms of with COVID and what's happening, especially in LA County, um, we're one of the hit is hard, hardest hit counties in, in the US, but we're very optimistic about the future. Obviously we're involved with a, pro, uh, a project that is visionary in its kind. You know, Stan Kroenke, the owner and, 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 and operator of the 298 acres that we call Hollywood Park, is really had a vision to create a global sports and entertainment destination. Yes, we're the home of the LA Rams and the LA Chargers on the NFL side. We also have uh, two esports teams that play on the, the, the Kroenke Sports Umbrella. In addition to that, it's really more about the sports and entertainment destination piece. We're really more than an NFL stadium. And when, when this was built uh, as that vision, we like to say the stadium was, was built for the future. You know, we talk about it's just because we opened in 2020 uh, and not really open, it was a soft opening for the NFL games that we had last fall. We opened in 2020, but we really were built for the future. We're an indoor, an indoor outdoor stadium that really focuses on highlighting the unique features of Los Angeles. From a technology perspective, we're, we're gonna have one of the largest video board experiences. So as fans come to the game, they really get to experience whether you're sitting on our eighth level of the stadium or you're sitting in level one, a unique experience that's, that you're not gonna be able to get at home. And really thinking about the future and kind of what, how we come out of COVID, what we've done is really looked at the next decade in Los Angeles. And, and, Los, An and Los Angeles is gonna be sort of the epicenter of sports. Uh, obviously we had our opening, a soft opening last fall with both the, the Rams and the Chargers. But next year in 2022, around this time frame, we're gonna be hosting the Super Bowl. In 2023, we're gonna be hosting the college football playoff. Uh, and in 2028, we're gonna be the opening and closing ceremonies for the Olympics, um, as well as many other large marquee events that we're in discussions about, including potentially hosting the World Cup in 2026. So with that said, we're optimistic about what's coming, but we're also realistic about the current circumstances. And we're working very close with our community to make sure that we're helping out in any way we can. Um, and we've really partnered up with, with the city of Los Angeles to figure out ways for us to bring people back and feel excited about Los Angeles. So we actually put together a video that I would like to share with everyone, just highlighting a little bit about our, our, our site and sort of the 298 acres.
So th this showcases a little bit of how we see the future. It's not just about match day. It's really about utilizing our campus 365 days a year, whether it's NFL, whether it's potentially soccer exhibitions or, or friendlies or it's meetings, it's happening here, it's esports, as you guys saw so through the video. So we're really working with all of our partners, uh, both local and globally, to make sure that we're ready to welcome fans when it's safe so it's safe to do so to the site. Allah, thank you. That was that was really impressive and, and what a fantastic venue um, you have there. And I'm, I'm just very blown away by the, the scale of it. I mean, a, a key part of the design there is um, you, you've got different different levels. Obviously, you've got your social areas and your hospitality areas. And this is, you know, this this is social gathering. I mean, you're, you say that you're you're optimistic. How do you feel over the next 12 months um, you can adapt or do you need to adapt to, to getting the fans back? And how do you feel that's going to look like? Hey, you know, I, we don't have the magic wand, obviously, of what's going to happen over the next six to 12 months. But we're preparing as much as we can uh, for when, again, when it's safe to do so, to be able to bring fans back from what we're doing. We see ourselves, again, as sort of the indoor-outdoor, you know, that uh, field to the stadium allows us to have a lot of public spaces within the what we call the canopy roof. Uh, under this canopy roof, you do have three venues, as you saw on the video, obviously a 70,000 seat stadium. Um, and then in between that, you have a two and a half acre large plaza where people can gather. Um, and, and also sort of on the touch point of this canopy roof, you have a 6,000 seat performance venue really geared towards concerts and um, conferences meetings, TED Talks, eSports. So when we thought about it, you know, obviously this was pre-COVID, it was really more about highlighting the unique features of living in Los Angeles. And living in Los Angeles is all about indoor, outdoor living. And obviously now with COVID, that also gives us some flexibility to have some indoor, outdoor space. And sort of, we've really spent our time educating our fans that haven't been able to be here to, so that they understand the spaces in videos like this. Uh, if you saw the NFL games during the season, we really made sure to highlight the different spaces and getting people comfortable to come back once that's safe to do so. And I just wonder with, with the scale that you have, you can, you can provide a solution for the city and, and to, to perhaps be a leader in, in the return to some sort of normality in social gatherings. You, you have the advantage of having huge space there to be able to, to bring entertainment of some sort back whilst under uh, you know, limited social distance perhaps. That's right. And I, and, I, and I mentioned that we're working very closely with our local, um, you know, governments, both on the on the Los Angeles side. You know, the stadium actually sits in Inglewood, which is just a little bit south of L.A., you know, about two and a half just on the map, just two and a half miles from LAX. So we really sort of sit closer to the beach. We're very working very closely with them to make sure that we have a plan for when it's safe to do so to welcome fans back whether it's, you know, a hybrid model where it's limited fans, you know, at first. Yeah. Uh, and then once, as we get to full capacity, obviously with Super Bowl next year, we're optimistic that we're going to be able to get to full capacity. Yeah, you've got some world-class events coming over the next couple of years as well. So how many match days, if you like, would, would you do in a normal year? If without COVID, what, what would your match day uh, number be? Well, you know, ideally, I think the building should be used 365 days a year, right? Whether it's small events, large events, um, with both of the NFL teams, you'd be between them, you have about 40, um, 40 games, plus we have two esports teams. Um, so really, the building should be busy. I would say it's our goal is to keep this building on 365 days. There shouldn't be no off days. And yeah. as I know, my colleague here, Scott, who came from Mercedes-Benz, has said in the past, you know, uh, with Mercedes-Benz, they were very busy, especially the first couple of years. And I can tell you that we've gotten a lot of interest, both pre-COVID and during COVID for people that want to bring events here, which is exciting. Uh, it's exciting and optimistic about the future. And again, it's all kind of our North Star in Los Angeles with culminating with the Olympics and potentially the World Cup. It's, I mean, it's incredible. And I think it, it should give us all confidence um, with the aspirations you have that you know we will return to normality and and you know, we will get back to having big crowds back at some point um different scales so uh, fantastic project 
really wish the best of luck and we'll, we'll bring you back in in a few minutes but thank you for that introduction thank you uh, we're going to go over to um magda so um just a few words on magda um hi magda good afternoon good afternoon are you in italy or in london at the moment are you in italy at the moment okay great um so magda, you, you're coming from an owner's perspective um and you need do you want to just say a few few words about yourself and what you're what you're doing over there yeah i will i you know uh, at the moment we i uh, i've been uh, emphasizing on the on the stadium uh, we we open our new dutch arena about uh, uh, we rebuilt it five years ago and um, so you know for us uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting what adolfo was saying because you know for us uh, the us is of course a reference and uh, in Italy, it's quite an innovative concept because, unfortunately, um, uh, stadium is always to is is still related only to football and uh, match day, which I think this was one of our major, you know, my major uh, objective to uh, to to go away from this concept and uh, to consider it more as a multi-purpose venue. So with all the concepts Adolfo was saying before, to apply it to an Italian and European market. So we have been quite innovative in that. I perceive it as, a, let's say, a, a, an innovative incubator, open 365 days a year with uh, different sports, not only football, with uh, events, concerts, Esports area and uh, area for, for families in general. So you know this. I'm I'm very fond about this uh, this concept, which for Italy I must say is very innovative because we are the only one really. Maybe together with Juventus, we are the only private-owned stadium. So you know this is what is it gives us such kind of flexibility to do so. Yeah, I mean you you're very much the innovator, and you're seeing. I mean for yourself. Um, yeah, you've, you've done the, the sustainability, the green stadium. You've done a lot of innovations where, as you say, in, in the Italian sport field, it is concentrating on more and just on the football or on the soccer side. I mean, how, how do you see the next 12 to 18 months coming for, for your venue? You, you talk a lot about the community and, and being a big part of the community. How do you see? Yeah. Do you see I think, OK, of course, at the moment, it's, it's very difficult. It's difficult for everybody. but. COVID also gave us a chance to, you know, to, to see it in a different way. And to is you almost force us to, to, to say that, okay, we, you are, we are on the right track. We have to think about alternative, uh, an alternative from the match day revenues. So that's what we are saying, what we are doing. And we have more time for planning, of course. So we have, um, uh, for us, you know, there is uh, probably the most important thing is to think of the digitalization of the stadium and then to introduce as well the different social concepts because I think, you know, we have to think that, I think the composition of the crowd is going to change as well. So you're going to have a much younger crowd um, and we are going to have, as you were saying before, um, a more need for social gathering. And so that's where we, you know, we, we are trying to, to have this uh, an, an area, an e-sports gaming area, where there, you, we, we, we aim to have an interaction between virtual and uh, real world. And I think this is very helpful and it's going to help to bring uh, the young generation that's, you know, and capturing more of this crowd. I think that the, the crowd is going to get younger and we have to, to focus on that. And also, I think we have to use, use football for, to give social, good social messages. So one of those is the, uh, the sustainability. And we are, we, we launched uh, a year ago, all the project of a green stadium. And so we are trying to and I think, you know, football is a great uh, vehicle and a great, you know, it's, it's so powerful that it can give really a strong message, a social message to the, you know, to the issues you want to introduce. So for us, um, the green policy is a key issue that you want to develop. So we are trying to have all our partners 
even all our you know fans to to get involved with this uh, with this uh, this uh, strategy and to be more conscious about uh, all these uh, issues. So this is what we are gonna um, focus on in the in the future months. Also, um, we are trying to develop uh, um, uh, family areas where you know we 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 will as uh, we will try to. To, to 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 make the family not only you know we do not want only to be a football place but we want to, to create a better fan uh, experience so we want our fan to you know to 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 stay longer and I think what Adolfo was saying is just uh, you know we we really for us it's a uh, uh, it's, it's it's great to see in United States you know all these realities and and to learn from that so a little bit what we we are trying to develop as well one of my fears here in bristol sport is that the lack of engagement currently with football fans especially young football fans um and the the gap in getting i suppose we're nearly 12 months into this covid and i haven't been able to host a a full capacity um game here for for close to a year and grassroots football and grassroots sports in the community has stopped because of COVID as well. So there, there is a concern around how, um, how the kids, I suppose the fans of the future, you know, how, how they are going to stay engaged and how do we attract them back? Is there anything you're doing in your community now um, with that in mind to engage with the community or engage with the grassroots, engage with the younger football fans to ensure that we, we stay relevant or that the stadium stays relevant, the club stays relevant? We tried, you know, we, we had different champions. We have our own as well e-game team. Uh, and uh, we are trying to, we, we anyway, develop different um, uh, online championships with them. And, you know, we try to, to, to keep them motivated in this way. Of course, it's, it's, uh, it's completely different. And this is why, you know, one of the, I think it, it the most important thing is that we go back uh, to, to the stadium. And this is why we are uh, now uh, one of our priorities together with our media partner uh, in front is we are planning a strict protocol for stadium. And we want to be the first one, hopefully, to, to you know, to make this, uh, this, uh, this um, trial and to be able to open as soon as possible and considering different scenarios, because otherwise, as you all say, it's uh, quite difficult to, I think it's a good timing for planning uh, and a, a, a time that we wouldn't have had having the match day uh, planning uh, going going on, you know? So I think we have to think really in that way, a planning and, and and uh, a lesson and uh, for, for the future more than, you know. Uh... Yeah, no, sure. I think, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just one more question, Magda, if I can. Um, again, going back to your, your view and, and your club, the ownership is viewed very much as innovators in Italy and, and you've got great applause, applause for, for what you're doing in these. Um, and just the forward thinking view that you're taking from Stadia introducing Mission Star Food and, and giving the, the fans a reason to stay within the stadium. I mean, I, we all want to be confident that's going to remain. Have you got the, the, does your facility allow that to happen under social distancing? Italy got hit hard in the early days. Are you comfortable? Yeah, I think, you know, we, again, you know, for us, we, we introduced many, uh, many, uh, many new concepts. For instance, as you said, we had uh, uh, star Michelin star, uh, chefs come in and, and cook every match day to our uh, to our hospitality. And uh, uh, so, what are we doing now? It, it is we are planning to have them, and then we are looking for other ones. And we are planning all the you know second half of the season and probably next season. Uh, the same, you know, it's, uh, we, we are trying to expand our hospitality, B2B and B2C. For instance, this is something in Italy was, it was not uh, quite uh, common. So for us, uh, it's 
very important to improve and to increase the B2B and B2C relationships of our partners. So we are, what we are doing right now, for instance, we are organizing a B2B lab, a, a, a digital one, okay? While last year, for, of course, we had it in the stadium. So we tried to keep up with all the concepts uh, of, our, of our stadium, uh, not physically, but digitally. So this is our, I think, it's our biggest uh, accomplishment, probably, uh, to, to transform what it was physically uh, virtually right now, just to keep up with all the motivation and uh, the amusement and the experience uh, from our partners and from our uh, fans. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head, the, the engagement with fans, but also B2B, you know, the, we need to keep on engaging the partners and bringing them on a journey with us. And, and things like this, you know, if it took 12 months ago to have, to have a, a digital forum like this that we, we're, we're reaching out to, it, you know, for Soccer X, it's just it's just trying to adapt to the world that we're in, um, and you know you're, you're absolutely right. We should be we should be getting the balance right between the fans and B two B, and I think you're doing great stuff there. The, the innovation that's coming out of your your venue um, and just just doing a review of what you're doing is pre COVID was definitely incredible, and, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, but we'll come back to you hopefully at, at the end with some further questions. So thank, thank you, Magda. You. Um, thank you. Scott. Scott, we'll um, go over to you. So you extensive experience in developing, opening and operating sports venues, uh, including the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, uh, Suffolk Hill Field in Seattle, the Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia and, and, and Miller Park. So you're well versed in stadium development. Um, you, you've been around it for a long time. Um, just over to you, really. What's, what's your feeling on, on where we are post-COVID and what we've heard so far and, and, and how you see the next? Again, we haven't got a magic, you know, magic window into the future, but just, yeah, what, what's your thoughts on, on what you've heard so far and what the future looks like? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I, you know, I think we're still in a challenging time for, for the foreseeable future. I mean, you, there's light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine, um, but I think we're going to have some significant headwinds for quite a while yet. Um, you know, the fear of the, of the, of the virus is going to linger for a while. Um, the, the fact that we've had a break in the action, people have done other things. Um, we've lost a little connection there, so we lost the momentum. Um, and then there's a, a fair number of people in, in society who have been hurt, you know, really dramatically financially. So those three things, um, you know, are going to present significant headwinds, I think, as we get back uh, to, to some sense of normal. Um, you know, what I've heard from everybody, and, and you know, Mercedes-Benz Stadium is a prime example of that, is it's really a community asset um, that we engage at many levels, and we try to book the venue as much as possible. And as Adolfo knows, uh, watching us in, in Atlanta with the Falcons, uh, with college football is really kind of a, another home team, if you will. And then Atlanta United, um, that building was humming 24-7. Um, and then being in the heart of Atlanta, um, <clears throat> right next to the Georgia World Congress um, and Atlanta being a big business hub, the building was booked all the time. I mean, we'd go right out of a match day with 70,000 people and the next morning there's a trade show on the field on the pitch uh, for 500,000 people. Um, so booking these buildings is gonna be, um, getting back to that normal rhythm is gonna be really important. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of financial pressure, obviously, that we're all feeling. Um, you know, when you host a match or a football game and there's 20% of the people there, uh, revenues are not good um, and expenses are up. Um, so we're gonna look for ways to book the building. Uh, we're gonna look for ways to build back that demand and we're gonna look for ways to do it in incorporating technology where we can enhance the fan experience, but also reduce the touch points, whether it's digital ticketing, uh, automated turnstiles, automated security checks, uh, cash lists, uh, anything we can do to kind of remove that potential fear of, of, of interacting. Um, and as we adopt the technology, we also reduce our costs. Mm -hmm. um, so while we have the cost pressure, we can, we can operate a little more cost effectively, hopefully uh, provide a safer and better experience for the guests. Uh, more seamless, remove the friction points, um, and try to get back and build back that demand that we, you know, a year ago, uh, we were all enjoying this humming right along, you know, not, not seeing what was coming. Uh, we were about to go into the men's final four basketball championships, um, and all of a sudden, lights out. So it's been a, it's been a really tough time. Um, but I will say, you know, making the connection in the community, it's been an opportunity to think about how we do that. Um, whether it's blood drives, the serving as a voting location, vaccination location, 
firing up the kitchens and feeding people in the community. So it's been a really good time to step back and think about how we can impact things in the community, um, even during COVID. Um, and the other thing I think, uh, much like Adolfo's got going on with, um, you know, the whole campus setting, um, being on the Georgia World Congress with the Convention Center, being near to downtown, having the Home Depot backyard available, which is a tremendous resource, a community asset that we have free programming going on regularly to bring the community in, whether it's a fitness thing or an entertainment thing. Um, and that's where the Georgia World Congress used to be. So it's directly across from where Mercedes-Benz Stadium is. I think we're going to continue to see ways to weave ourselves into the community, to, to have social impact. Uh, I like what Magda said, talking about sustainability and, and what social, social messages we want to give and convey. And particularly with younger fans who, who are taking on these challenges that we have uh, with Black Lives Matter, with different social issues, environmental justice issues. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity to, to do good and, and bring purpose into our business. Thanks, Scott. I mean, you're very much seen as a pioneer in, in the, the green um, and sustainability within Stadia. If you're designing a stadium now, um, compared to 12 months ago, you talk about tech, um, what would fundamentally be different? So it, what, what has the last 10, 12 months of, of COVID taught us in, in future design um, or, or has it made a difference? Yeah, you know, I guess that remains to be seen a bit, but uh, some of the themes, um, you know, reducing congestion points, redu reducing touch points and incorporating as much technology as we can, um, removing friction and any, any type of the, uh, the game day, match day experience, I think is key. Um, and, and again, the social aspects, what are we doing to be good community members? Um, what are we doing to give back? What purpose are we weaving into the way we do business, which isn't so much the physical aspects of the stadiums, um, but how do we program our spaces and, and how do we have that big impact? And obviously sustainability is important to me. Um, it's gonna continue to be increasingly important. I think people realize we've gotta, we've gotta change the way we, we do things and sport has a real opportunity to be a leader in this space. Um, and I, I think with some of these social issues, as we've seen, um, you can either be a leader or you can, you know, get the stick. Uh, it's either a carrot or a stick. Um, and I think we all realize we'd rather be on the carrot and lead uh, from the right place than, than to have to defend ourselves. Um, and I think the days are gone where we can kind of just do business and make money and try to win. Uh, we now have to do it with purpose and we have to contribute to society. So sustainability and social justice issues are going to be, I think, core in how we go forward. Uh, absolutely, Scott. And it's interesting because I think, you know, from personal experience, four or five years ago, when we're sitting on similar panels um, and collectively we were talking about state and developments and about uh, the future of state and design, you know, a, a big part was the headline was return on investment. And, and of course, we're all in business and that, that should be a driver for what we're in. Um, I do, and, and listening to Adolfo Magda now yourself, community is very much at the heart of it and sustainability is very much in the heart of it and I do wonder if um, you know again as COVID really helped us as being big parts big, big players within our towns and cities really illustrate the impact that stadia and venues have on the community for, for, for loads of reasons you know here at Ashton Gate we're like you said we're, we're a vaccine centre and um, we have 10,000 people coming through our doors every week and I would nearly explain it like liberation, you know, the, the, the feeling and, and the uh, the atmosphere that's around is it's surreal, you know, but it's it really is. It's not what the stadium was designed for, but because the stadium was designed for events, if you like, we're able to host this probably like, you know, everyone else with the panel. But it is it is just I do wonder the future of stadium. Are we going to become more? Well, hopefully that's it's, it's not a question it's a statement we should be more part of the community and we should be leaders and and you know our government should be talking to us and how we can get crowds back safely we're, we're the experts everybody in this in this room here is an expert in their own right on crowd management and sustainability you know everything that we spoke about so it, it's it's interesting that community we've all mentioned community a lot more than return on investment in the last you know half an hour and that, that that's that's interesting but i think it's also quite endearing yeah, and I, and I think the jolt that we've all experienced with COVID um, and in the States with, you know, social justice issues, and of course, that's not unique to us. It's, it's common, unfortunately, in a lot of parts of the world. Um, it's given us a chance to really stop and think about what is that ROI? And it's not just about money anymore. I think it's about what we do to make a difference in the community. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions from the audience. I'll just throw out to the panel um, and then we'll come to you. Have you a few minutes? So uh, a couple of questions. Question one. 
Do we feel that multi-purpose stadiums for concerts, other sports could lose their identity? Um, if you look at West Ham um, and the London Stadium, so I don't know if you're familiar um, with, with the London Stadium, which was developed for the Olympics, West Ham um, then took it over as their football stadium. Magda, you're probably familiar with, with, the, with the Watford connections. Um, is there a risk as we, we all talk about, and starting with Adolfo's uh, clip about the multi-use venue, that sport teams lose their identity? So, you know, the, the heritage is associated with West Ham, for example, which are, you know, big London team, have they, are they at risk of losing their brand identity? Um, so it's open question really to, to the group, see if I made any comments. Magda, I'll start with you, but perhaps you're, you might have an opinion on that. Yeah, um, I, I do not believe so. Uh, I think, you know, we are looking into a more modern way to, to, to find, you know, to, to, uh, to find solutions and especially, you know, to, to, to give, uh, to, to really change the, the concept of uh, of the of the stadia is not any any longer a place where you play football, but it's a multi-purpose venue, which is a completely different thing. And I think we must be it's a, it's our objective then to to keep up with this the spirit motivation and uh, the the let's say the, the the sense of belonging of the of the supporters. So, so Magda, with that in mind, do you think it's a new brand that we're, we're creating to so the home of, of the football club becomes a home of concerts, it becomes the home of, of meeting and events or esports? Is, oh, is, is that a new marketing strategy? Well, it, it, it will still be the home of football, but it's one of the activities. I mean, it, it will be the home of football, but then it, it must be used as, you know, a, a multifunctional a uh, multifunctional way of 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 uh, reach the different even different uh, uh, segment of the market so i think it's uh, you know it's a it's a different way to see it but and we do it, it, it it's it, it's interesting the point because you you can't miss the contact with the with the supporters and you must be very careful to not to you know not to um, to change the feeling and uh, you know, and sometimes even if from our supporters, we have this uh, this problem. They say, "Oh, you are thinking so much about uh, the the stadium, maybe not so much <laughs> about the, the the pitch results." And uh, but, but I don't think so. I mean, there are two parallel but different uh, ways to look at it. Okay, so yeah, interesting. Has anybody else got any thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah. Next question, Scott. Mark, yeah, Mark, I, I think you bring up a good point um, with being multi purpose, we got to be really careful that we still, um, on match day, it's all about Atlanta United. On a football game day, it's all about the Falcons. Um, and so we've got to stay true to that. And I think, you know, the rituals we have and how we treat our supporters and our fans, um, we've got to be authentic. And the venue needs to represent that, that tenant, if you will, on that day. Um, so we got to be really intentional about that and, and protect that, or, or we do risk, um, you know, losing some identity, I think. Um, and I'd, I'd be interesting with, with Adolfo too, on the technology that we have in these new stadiums to go digital, because with the push of a button, we can now change a look and feel. And with these dramatic halo video boards and all the TVs and everything we have, um, you know, I think that helps create the right backdrop. But I think it's really about how we treat the customer that day and the rituals that are, are you know, so ingrained in match day and game day. Um, that the feel, uh, it looks right and it feels right. And so we've got to be a little bit of a chameleon to be able to make that switch um, or we do run the risk of, of uh, you know, damaging our, our main tenant or our main brand, if you will. Uh, abs absolutely. I'm I, sorry, you want to come in? Yeah, please. Yeah, so, I, I, I will come I to you with, minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I agree with you, um, Scott. I think for us, it was really important, obviously, with, ho <clears> with <throat> us hosting two NFL teams to make sure that the, the home environment felt for a fan, from a fan's perspective, felt like you were going to either an LA Rams game or an LA Chargers game. And we have like, again, and go back to the video, we have 5,000 digital boards within the site, right? So really as you're coming into the 298 acres, you're gonna know it's a Rams game or a Chargers game because of all the digital presence throughout the site, you know? And then the other piece kind of going back to the Ziz Dilute, the, the home team product. Uh, in our case, I, I don't, I disagree with that. I just think that 
we live in a very diverse city in Los Angeles with over 10 million people in the in LA County and not a, let alone the, the greater LA County. So for us, it's, it's a way to expose our teams and our product um, as we have a Taylor Swift concert when we talk about reaching uh, younger generations. Part of our strategy when we talked about the opening of SoFi Stadium was we wanted to be in the forefront. Be, we wanted to have Taylor Swift open the stadium as the first female artist to ever open up an NFL stadium. But we also knew that the audience was younger. Uh, we knew that we were going to be able to get the NFL fan already to come out to the SoFi Stadium. But what was our other storyline? So we, we kind of did that with a purpose. And I think that's kind of where we control sort of the narrative of the storytelling of a stadium. You, uh, we, you know, the stadium itself is just, you know, it's no longer four walls. It's really a community hub, as we've all talked about. And what happens inside of this community hub is really the stories, right? Whether it's a Taylor Swift concert one night or it's a community 5K the, ne the next day. I think for us, this allows us to really reach broader audiences than just the NFL. Um, and I think that that goes back to that vision of we want to make sure that we're a global sports and entertainment destination for all, not just for Los Angeles, not just for Inglewood, but really it's a global hub. Yeah, I think that that's one point. One and caveat, we'll come to you in a moment. But the one theme throughout is um, flexibility. Um, he heritage is absolutely important, I think. But it is, I think, Scott, you mentioned it, it's it's been sensitive to that by having the flexibility to switch to Taylor Swift back and, and, and but being that big hub within the community or in, in the city or in, in the country. So yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting. It's, I think over the last five or six years, as people are saying, it's just, it's evolved. And it's great to hear again, just very community focused. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, Caviar, sorry, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. So then we got, I've got a load of questions that because the panel's coming through. So um, over to you in Valencia, again, very big part of the community, um, Spain this time. Um, yeah, over to you and, and what, what you're doing and, and anything you want to add so far from what you've heard. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, as you are speaking, uh, the stadium is part of, of the city, no? very important and iconic place to encounter people, uh, fans, uh, city citizens of the city and uh, it's a special place in that sense. Uh, here in Valencia, we have the oldest stadium in La Liga, in first division. We have Mestalla that has 98 years old, close to a first centenary of the stadium. And uh, I think I agree, we have to, to maintain more, more, more in that time uh, the balance between the errands, the tradition, and the new era. No? And in that sense, uh, in that moment, we have to reveal the identity of the stadium the, the, to show that we are more than a club. And in that sense, for example, we we are more integrated in the in the community. Uh, we in that moment of lockdown on the pandemic, uh, we started a, a new initiative in the stadium that was to be uh, the, the center of the delivery for uh, food donations for food families that we started after the lockdown in May of this year. We are closed in to one year uh, to use our stadium like part of our community. Uh, giving that food for uh, families with low resources. We are collaborating with the biggest uh, NGO of uh, one of the biggest of Spain. And uh, we are each uh, two times for a week, uh, each 15 days, uh, we are delivering food for 300 families. And we did a special donations also in Christmas, in the, the night of uh, Christmas Eve, special donations also with our players, not presencially, but with message or board, uh, people from, uh, from the club, uh, employees as volunteers collaborating with, uh, with our community, giving that, that food. And also with uh, Chef Jose Andres, La Liga also involved. And uh, we, we think that we are more than a club and we have to show in that moment. No? It's, it's very sad, I can't stay with our people in the stands. We, and in that sense, we are trying to, uh, to be with them also from other, uh, in other senses also engaging with, with them uh, digitally with that measures in the stadium. We are offered the Mestalla to the local government to when we start with the massive vaccinations uh, is or, or a space is open to them. And uh, we want to be more than uh, only football space, always respecting the, the tradition and our history, but, but also being very committed with, uh, with the community. Yeah, I think it's, again, it's, it's 
I've seen what you guys have done there and, and you know, the, the distribution of food for, from the stadium to, um, to those that need it. I think it's, you know, it should be recognised. It's incredible. And again, key parts of the community. I mean, your head of content and um, production, um, I'm just watching the clock in the top left corner. I've still got a load of questions that the, the panel want to ask, but if I just ask you one quick question, I'm curious yeah. myself. Um, a lot of the sport in the UK is, and so I think it's the same in Europe, we're streaming. So it's digital, everything at the moment is digital and people can watch from their own homes. How do you feel, um, do you feel that's gonna continue? Will the appetite be strong enough? Um, and will fans trust us? It's sort of a half question somebody else asked. Will, how, how do we get fans to trust us to, to get back to the stadia rather than sit at home and watch it on Sky or, or watch the game on TV? Mm -hmm. I think first of all is, is to be sure that, that they are not going to have a risk no, in that new, New era we can call, no, and uh, we have to take a, every measure to to be sure that our fans or people are going to be safe in our stadium, no. Uh, the first, the first is to to they have this warranty, and uh, I think we have to appeal to the feeling that they feel when they are in our stadium, no, and how they feel our team, and we have to engage them constantly. Now we can do presentially; uh, it's a pity, but we have to. To be connected with them every day, every time, for every target. Uh, you spoke more about the young people. Young people, I think, have a mindset for the consumer very different. We have to engage, for example, with different content. We have different strategies for each social media platform, each digital platform. TikTok challenge. We did a lot of video calls from our players, or ambassadors with, or ambassadors with with older people. Uh, the, the players with young guys uh, and stay in touch with them. They have to feel that we are part of, uh, of we are together, we are a family. And yeah. uh, like a family, they, they have to miss us. I think they miss, they miss the, to stay in, in our stadium. And uh, we have to help uh, the environment to when uh, we can and the pandemic is finishing, we cross fingers. Uh, they, they are going to be very happy to come back. And uh, they, we guarantee that uh, they can stay another time with us supporting the, the, the team and the club. No, I think, I mean, you can hear the passion in your voice. I know you guys have, have, have done so much for the community in Valencia and, and um, I wish I had more time to talk to you, but I can see the clock just ticking down. There's a question, again, if I can just extend it to the panel is, um, how do we get, uh, and Scott, with your, I suppose, design um, expertise, how can we get fans to trust us? Because there might be apprehension. Uh, what is it we can do to offer reassurances to fans to, when, when we can open to return? Yeah, that, that's a tough question, you know, how to get in their heads to be comfortable. Um, we, you know, we, we've got to have things clean. We've got to have things safe. We've got to avoid pinch points. We've got to make things as much touch-free as possible. Um, and we got to get that vaccine out there. Um, and, and hopefully people will come around. Okay, great. Well, we're bang out of time. So, um, look, I think we could have talked for ages here. So, um, sorry to rush you right at the end, Caviar. Um, and perhaps we can catch up again. But um, I think I've been prompted to hand back to this studio. Um, so thank you everybody for your contribution. I've just been said actually done through the questions. Been a, there is a couple more questions. So if the studio can give me just a, one more minute to ask another couple of questions or not, if somebody can, you have to get. Okay, thank you. No, we're, we're done. So I'll hand back to the studio. Uh, thank you everybody for your time today and thank you for watching. Thank you.